Okay, I'll start by asking you to introduce yourself. I'm Brian Wally. Um, do you want to, me to say what I was or am or what? Uh, yeah, that'd be lovely. I'm presently uh, the chairman of the London area of the Royal Fusiliers, Royal Regiment of Fusiliers Association. Mm-hmm. Um, so, were any of your family in the army? Yes, my father served in the First World War. So was that sort of a motivation for you? And No, um, the, the motivation came from the government because I was uh, liable to serve as a national serviceman. Okay. After the war, everybody was called up. And how did you feel when you got the call up for national service? Well, I knew I, it was happening because I was at school and, you know, all my fellows left and went in the army or the Navy or Air Force and I, I knew I was going to follow. And in fact, I volunteered when I was still at school. So did you feel it prevented you from doing anything such as higher education? No. Um, and having been drafted, um, how did you end up in the Coldstream Guards and Fusiliers? Well, I, I volunteered, so I was allowed to choose which regiment. And um, uh, my father, having been in the Welsh Guards, I thought I'd go in the Brigade of Guards and um, uh, uh, another boy, ex-boy at school, um, had joined the Coldstream and he came down um, during my last term and he said, why, why don't you go into the Coldstream? So I said, all right, and I wrote and, you know, I had to go for an interview and things up in Wellington Barracks and I got accepted and then I went back to school. So that's how it happened. How did you get from there to the Fusiliers? Well, I, I joined the, the Coldstream at the, right at the end of the year, 28th of December 1948. And because um, I, was, I joined in 1948 as opposed to 1949, I became a candidate for an emergency commission as opposed to a National Service Commission. And it meant that I would do uh, 18 months service instead of two years. And and also I didn't have any obligations to do uh, territorial service. But actually the Coast Room Guards arranged that because I was due to be called up on the 6th of January. But they wrote to me and said, come and join us on the 28th and you go into a different category. Rather clever, you know. (laughs) So we signed up at Wellington Barracks on the 28th and then went off on leave for a week. Went home, in fact, and then reported to Kate from the training barracks um, as previously arranged on the, the, I think it was the 6th, something like that. Um, And in terms of your training, what what sort of things did you do? What were you involved in? What, as a basic training? Yeah. It was extremely hard. I have to say, I would not want to do it again. Um, it, we, it was relentless. We were pursued for three months. And um, we had no time to ourselves. We had half an hour for naffy every evening. Otherwise, we were under control. And we couldn't leave the barrack room without asking permission or anything. So it was quite relentless, but it was extremely good service and uh, training because the um, the NCOs we had the the warrant officers and NCOs who trained us were extremely good. The best got sent back to do the training of the recruits because it was a step up in their career pattern, which meant that the best we got the best instructors. And when I subsequently went to um, office cadet school the, the, the group of fellows who'd been to Catrum in the Brigade of Guards always seemed to win the champion company and it wasn't because we were better people it was just that we were better trained I think mm. uh, or tougher trained and because a lot of people up there when I went were my school friends you know, they joined other regiments but they hadn't had the, the pounding and I think it same applies today when you, you know, people join the Paras and the Marines and the SAS. It's, it's much tougher than ordinary. So could you describe an, an average day of that training? 
Well, we'd have Ravalli at 6.15. I'll tell you one incident, which is quite funny. Which was on, we joined on a Friday, and on Saturday we had a, a man called a trained soldier. He was a guardsman, and he was meant to teach us all the basic things on how to clean and basic regimental history and stuff like that, and looked after us in the barrack room. And we had to ask his permission to go out of the room and we'll come back. Whenever we came through the door or went out of the door, we had to ask his permission. And this went on on Saturday. He was there and we drew kit and that sort of stuff and started cleaning. On the Sunday, the valley was a half an hour later, quarter to seven, I think, something like that. And he started shouting and screaming at us and from his bed. And we were... 18-year-olds, he was a schoolboy, so it was a bit unusual because language was not quite so free in those days as it is today. And um, he was uh, effing and blinding us and um, lying in bed. We all leapt out of bed and we started dressing and the door opened and in came this, what I thought was a huge figure in a hat with his peak down here and a Sam Brown and medals and a, and a paste stick. And it turned out to be Regimental Sergeant Major Rooney of the Irish Guards, under whose um, uh, administrative control we were we were based. And he just looked at, he just stood there in the door, and he said, "You men get down to breakfast. Train soldier, report to my quarters in half an hour." This chap came out of his bed like a rocket. You've never seen anybody get out of bed quicker. And when we came back from breakfast. Not only had he disappeared, not only had his kit disappeared, but his bed and his locker had gone. All trace of him had disappeared from the barrack room. And I'd never heard of him from that day to this. But what would have happened, he would have been bounced, he probably would have done some detention or something. Then he would have been bounced back with, to his battalion, and the battalion commander would probably have got a rocket for sending a rather poor soldier. And by lunchtime we had another one, and um, he was he was he was better. So you mentioned the training. And that 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 was one day. That was the first day, Sunday, and then. But the normal was to get up at quarter past six, and then we'd, you know, they'd pursue us when we were shaving, you know. And I only shaved once a week at that time, but I had to shave every day because that was the form. So I had to shave without a razor in, scrape the soap off, and. Um, you, you were given sort of two minutes to do it all, and there was always shouting and chasing you. Then we'd go down to breakfast, and then we'd come back, and we went on to what was called Adjutant's Drill Parade every day, the whole depot, all the regiments, and, and us fellows, and the adjutant, and we'd drill and stuff. And that was a fairly big ordeal, because we were had up for dirty boots and anything, any faults and things like that. And then we'd start doing training, you know, uh, always a lot of drill. And then weapon training, which was uh, um, not, not much weapon training, but we'd, we played around with machine guns and, you know, Bren guns at that time and rifles and things. And then we did um, map reading and other basic military training, had lectures and things, but there was always a lot of drill. Morning and afternoon we drilled. And it, it, the, the purpose is to get a, a group of people to, to be obedient. If somebody shouts down, down you went. And that might have saved your life. And if the quicker you get down, the better. And so all our, all, that's the purpose of drill, is to get people working as a group. Um, so were there any aspects of the training you found particularly challenging? Because you mentioned it was quite tough. The whole lot. It was, it was like a nightmare. I couldn't believe that God was doing it to me. No, really, it's, you, you can't visualise it. can't be that bad in prison in the old days, not prison today where they've got television and things. But it, it, was, it, was, a, it, it was amazing, amazing, because you were never right. Whatever you did, you were wrong. And if, if you... I, I was had up for dirty belt or something one time and I was marched in and the charge was read out and my company commander asked me if I had anything to say and I said nothing to say sir and he said I should have 
something to say, and gave me three extra drills, which meant Wednesday afternoon and Friday af- Saturday afternoon, because that was sports time. And the next time I went in, I had dirt in my bayonet, allegedly. What well, anything to say? I said, uh, it was clean when I went on parade. And he said, don't come in here making excuses, three extra drills. So I was never going to be right, whatever. And you weren't meant to. And it was a part of the system. Mm. Did you participate in any specialist courses at all? Not there, no. It's all basic military training. So which ones later on did you participate? Well, I mean, I went up to... The, I had to go to a... Uh, uh, officer cadet, officer's um, selection board and that was a three day thing I went down to Westbury in Wiltshire and there we were in groups a lot, not from me I went. I was the only one from Cape Trump, but I was in a group of eight we all wore khaki denim no hats no badges, no nothing just a, a number And we did three days of different tests, discussions, you know, about problems. And they set a problem like the formation of a rehabilitation centre for old soldiers. You know, you had to discuss, I mean, what do we know about it at 18? But you have some ideas how, where you might have it, somewhere near a town or out in the wilds and all sorts of things. So you discuss that. And all the time there's one or two officers sitting in the background making notes and all they had was your number so they didn't know who you were and what regiment or what school or anything so there was no favouritism and then we did physical tests you know the eight of us had to take a, a, a barrel and a short piece of wood across a wall and the wood wasn't quite long enough you know this sort of thing you have to get two people to hold the wood and one person to help the other up and you know it's a teamwork thing initiative tests and we do all sorts of things like that for three days and then, at the end, you were told whether you passed or not. And then, at that point, you, you got your badges back. But only the colonel, the ch- commandant of the, of the um, school selection board, knew your name. And all the other fellas didn't, all these other men. And they all wore their hat badges, the other officers and the invigilators. And which was very fair. I've always thought it was the fairest way of doing a selection. I think it, it ought to happen in universities, in my view. Then you can't have favouritism. You just, you know, you don't know where, what school they came to, or whatever, and, and, and uh, you know, you get selected if you're good enough. Perhaps it's a bit unfair, but, I mean, that's what I think. Um, and after your training, what, what did you do then? I went up to Eton Hall, which was the Officer Cadet School for Infantry, and I did four months there. And they, they train you to be an officer, so-called, you know. You get officers training, leadership and all that. But again, a lot of drill and stuff, but we found it very easy, having had this very hard three months. We thought that the officer cadet school was like a holiday camp by comparison. But other people found it quite hard. And after your training, did you feel prepared as a, as a leader and an officer? Not really, no. You... You, in certain ways, you, you know what you're doing and, and basic manoeuvres and, and, and leading your men and telling them where to go and what to do, but you don't feel over superior. You know, you, you rely on them so much. You know, the, the, the soldiers firing the rifle beside you is pretty important. It's, it's not just a person you boss about. But, um, and, and, you know, when, when, you, when you're second lieutenant at 19, you don't have too much authority, and you've got sort of corporals and sergeants who are 23 and 24, and that's quite old. You know, it's a, it's a whole school intake ahead of you, isn't it? A 24 to 19 is five years, and you, if you go to school at 13 and you live at 18, he's, he's left school when you arrive. So he's quite a, sort of a senior man, and you, you treat them with... with um, Consideration. They, they, they do what you tell them, but they often tell you what you should tell them. <laughs> do you see what I mean? The sergeants and NCOs in the army are very, very important, particularly to the young officers. So, going back to your training, what do you find the hardest aspect of it was? 
Well, the, the fact you had no, had no time off. But when we came back off, off parade at quarter past four, um, I can't remember the timings exactly. We, we'd go down to meal, at a meal and come back at quarter to five or five. We had to go about a quarter of a mile, and it wasn't next door. We'd have to sort of walk down there, march down there. And then you'd come back, and from quarter past five until quarter to seven, we used to have to sit astride our beds, you know, and you'd sit with the pillow end, and you'd have a, your ground sheet on the bed and all your kit, and you'd clean, and you weren't allowed to talk for an hour and a half, and this trained soldier would be walking around telling you regimental history and things like that, and, you know, telling you what you're doing wrong about your cleaning and so on, and this went on until quarter to seven, and then we'd have a half an hour naffy break and then at quarter past seven until quarter past ten we went on cleaning but we were allowed to sit side saddle you didn't have to sit astride the bed you sat and you could talk what do you mean by a naffy break oh well, it meant you could go to the naffy Na uh, the naffy is, uh, is the canteen you, you don't know the naffy no so Na uh, Naval Army and Air Force Families Institute Okay. And it was, um, um, they ran, like the Americans have a thing called PX, I think. You know, they, they have uh, shops and things for their soldiers to buy, buy things. This was a very primitive um, naffy. We'd buy buns and, and, and coffee and tea and soft drinks. Not, no, no beer. And, um, you know, you could get, I don't, I don't know, we had hot dogs and things. It was rationing at that time, so food wasn't all that easy. What was the food like when you were getting embarrassed? Actually, it was quite good. We needed it. We were hungry most of the time. And um, we, we, it was quite good. Sort of stew-like stuff. But I don't remember being hungry. We were always ready to eat whatever there was. And it wasn't bad. And, um, but when we went on the ranges, you know, we went down, we did uh, uh, three, three weeks of Purbright, which is near Aldershot. And that enabled us to do practical field craft. You know, that's camouflaging and crawling around, trying to be unseen or hide yourself. And then firing on the range and things like that. All that's, that kind of stuff was totally outdoors. The, um, the Naffy vans or the, or the Church Army, the Salvation Army, one of these vans used to appear. They, they used to go around all the training areas in that area, visiting different lots of troops. And they'd bring tea and coffee and soft drinks and, and buns, which we call wads. Tea and wads were the order of the day. And we'd buy up jam tarts and eat hundreds of jam tarts. But there were only, there weren't, you know, and it, I, I remember on one occasion, it must have been about 50, there were about 50 of us, and we ate about 300 jam tarts. We cleared the van. <laughs> we were always hungry, but the, the food was okay. Um, now going to National Service part. It, I was. This was National Service. Okay. I, you know, I was then in the National Service system. At this point, you know, once I'd left school, I joined. I just the technicality I was doing was uh, as an emergency candidate, but I was then into the National Service system. Mm. Would you say National Service should be reintroduced today? Um, well, of course, I I think it does people a lot good. But I don't think the army liked it very much. The professional soldiers at that time didn't like it very much because it's quite disruptive to have it, people arriving and leaving all the time. In the regular army, a, a man joins the army after training, joins a regiment and stays with the battalion for maybe two or three years, or, or, or as long as maybe. With us, we were there so short time there were intakes coming in, going out, and the regulars were there, and they kept on seeing people arriving, and then these people used to boast, only three more days until I go home, and these chaps are facing another six months abroad, you know. So it wasn't, wasn't the best for the regular army. I think it was good for the young men of England, 
I think if they got if they bothered, it was very good for them. And um, uh, I think uh, I don't know. I think uh, national service ought to possibly be introduced, not as a military thing, as a concept for national service. I mean, if if there was a fire in the New Forest and they wanted five thousand young men, they should be able to scoop them up from because they're registered for national service from Bournemouth and Portsmouth and Southampton, they could scoop them in. Like the territorial do now, they go off to Afghanistan, but in, in my view, if we had national registration for national service, is what I, I'm in favour of. Not do it, but then you knew where you could get men to do jobs, like floods in Cockermouth or, um, as I say, forest fires and so on. And, and, you know, people would be obliged to turn up. They, they, would, they would be penalised. And if, if you could give them a fibre a year, it doesn't matter, just as a token to show that they had taken the Queen's fibre. It used to be a Queen's shilling. I don't know, do they have the Queen's shilling these days? Is it called the Queen's shilling? No. When you signed up, I, I, not with me, but certainly in the First World War, they used to get given the shilling, which was significant. People, you know, didn't earned too many shillings. That was the Queen's shilling. But that, that, so, to answer your question, I think it wouldn't work in today's army. And I think the territorial army is a replacement, but it's not the same. Because, you know, they, they do all their training at weekends, and then they get shipped off to maybe Afghanistan or, or Iraq for six months, and they come back pretty fully trained soldiers. But they're not necessarily a unit. They've gone into a the teamwork isn't used. If you train as a team, you should go out as a team, really. Um, would you say work in the other forces, not just the army? Probably even less, because, I mean, they're quite technical, aren't they? You know, the Air Force, uh, uh, a lot of individuals, you know, you've got all the technical people doing the mechanics and looking after aircraft and air traffic control and all these things. And the pilots and things are very, very highly trained and very expen expensive. Navy, I don't, I can't tell you about. Uh, I think the same sort of thing applies. The odd man going on a ship doesn't help much unless he's going to heave on a rope. But they don't do much heaving on ropes these days, I didn't think. But, uh, you know, the, the principle was the same. People went in as national service and they, they manned a fair part of a ship. You know, they they formed quite a a, a chunk of the of the um, total crew because it was you know the navy was big and so was the air force and so was the army. I went into the army because they they weren't taking anybody to fly at that time. They had all the pilots in the world just coming out from the war, so I I didn't want to be on the ground in the air force. I joined the army instead.